Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for, from our refreshment break. And we now have another very knowledgeable and distinguished panel before us uh, to deal with your further questions. And our first speaker is Calvin Hopkins, the Member of Parliament for Luton North. Calvin has recently served as the Shadow Culture and Media Secretary, but I can say how pleased I am that he has shared the burden of those collective responsibilities. Kelvin is an authentic and principled voice that is much needed in support of our withdrawal from the European Union. He has been a consistent critic of the actions of the European Union from a socialist perspective. He has done this at a time when most of his colleagues, for some inexplicable reason, have chosen to ignore the hardship and deprivation caused by monetary union to working people across whole swathes of southern Europe. Calvin has proved to be more in tune with the concerns and anxieties of Labour voters than the overwhelming bulk of his parliamentary colleagues. And let's be clear, without the support of millions of core Labour voters, the referendum would have been lost. The results achieved in parliamentary constituencies previously represented, for instance, by Peter Mandelson and David Miliband, real, reveal how deep the gulf really was between the people and those parachuted in to represent them. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very important that Calvin Hopkins and indeed Anthony Coughlin are with us today. Calvin has different views to most of us here regarding the shape and scope of what the state should do. But there are some issues that are more important than the level of taxation or the size of the public sector. Sometimes politicians of the left and the right must come together. And they must come together when democracy and self-government is at stake. Yeah. When I entered Parliament in 1992 and immediately voted against the Maastricht Treaty, one of the most encouraging factors was that some of the finest minds in the lab on the Labour benches, such as Denzel Davis and Brian Gould, had done exactly the same analysis from their point of view and had come to the same conclusions as myself. When the threat to self-government is so clear, men of the right and left must come together. There was, of course, no greater example of this than in May 1940, when Churchill, Eden, Attlee and Bevin came together to save our country from fascism. When Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party, Calvin declared that it was the end of Blairism. And as far as the policy making of the Labour Party is concerned, that is certainly true. However, there is now so much patronage available to Prime Ministers that the supporters of Tony Blair remain entrenched in many of our national institutions and even in the High Court. <laughs> Regrettably, Regrettably, we also had a Conservative Prime Minister 
for six years, who declared himself heir to Blair. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give a warm welcome to a principal politician who represents the views of millions of Labour voters on the issue of our leaving the European Union. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I shall try to live up to that tribute. You make your own judgments at the end of my speech. But um, uh, I uh, say uh, it's important to have a view from the left. I say a view because there are various views on the left. Uh, mine is a particular view, I think the correct view. Another great politician, I think, who I stood on platforms with many, many times was Tony Benn. And had Tony Benn lived a bit longer, he would have spearheaded our campaign from the left. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I did my best and, and I, I wrote a small pamphlet which I intended to give to other Labour MPs. But uh, Kate Hoey was very complimentary about it, said it should be published. So we published it and we printed 500 copies. And uh, they disappeared very quickly. And then we did another 500 copies and they disappeared. And during the campaign, we couldn't keep up with demand. And the, the total in the end was 141,000 copies. Which went... <laughs> which went to many northern Labour constituencies, and I like to think it had a little bit of an influence on, on, on Labour views. But 37% of Labour voters voted to leave, 70% of Labour constituencies outside of London voted to leave, and I'm very pleased that my own constituency voted substantially in favour of leaving as well. Um, so, but the year has been, it's been a momentous year, uh, and the victory in the referendum was absolutely a wonderful experience for, for me and for all of you, I'm sure, too. But not just that, we saw the departure of a Prime Minister, a new Prime Minister in place. Um, but we still have some remainers who are trying to derail or at least delay our exit from the EU. And I think we've got to work hard to make sure that doesn't happen. I have to say that I think any um, po political party that tries seriously to derail the decision, uh, to reverse the decision or to have another, they will suffer very, very badly at the polls. And I hope that my party will be wise enough not to do that. Um, uh, I should say, uh, the, the term Brexit suggests it's only Britain, you know, but it's actually the United Kingdom. But UK exit doesn't quite go so well as Brexit, does it? Anyway, I was delighted by the result. It was a, a massive victory for democracy, powers being returned to Parliament, laws in future to meet at Westminster and not in Brussels. During my, I spoke many, many times during the campaign, um, mostly to Labour, Left, Trade Union order audiences, but sometimes to mixed audiences as well, with Conservative colleagues on the platforms. Um, uh, but I said always, I said, I'm a passionate European, I do love Europe. Um, I want Europe to, to, to be a, you know, a, a place of democracy and freedom for everybody in Europe, not just for Britain. Um, but the EU is not Europe. It is a political construct fixed above many of the European nations, not all, but many of them. It is not Europe. But they keep on using Europe as a shorthand for the EU, and it is not. I always talk about the EU. But I do say, and I was being interviewed at length by an academic writing a book about the referendum. He takes a different view from me. Quite a nice man. He went to the same school as me many, many years ago. But uh, he, he, he took my points, although he was very uncomfortable about it. Um, but I did say that if I was, you know, sitting quietly on my own, enjoying myself, I would probably be listening to J.S. Bach, drinking French Burgundy, and looking and trying to improve my French. So I'm definitely European, but I'm totally opposed to the European Union, which is anti-democratic and I think fairly economically as well. So um, I make that point. Um, what I want to see is is that all of Europe being an association of independent, self-governing, democratic countries cooperating where appropriate for mutual benefit. I'm sure we'd all be happy with that. We can, we, we, we can. And indeed, there are many people on the left as well as the right in, in Europe, in the, on the, in the European continent, who feel like I do. I recently was invited to Denmark. I don't know if I mentioned that the last time I was here, but I was invited to speak a few months ago to the... Um, the Danish People's Movement Against the EU, and uh, the only time in my life I've ever had a standing ovation, I have to say, but they, they're very pleased. But and they, also, they also gave me the, the ultimate accolade for, for a, a guest in uh, a guest speaker in um, 
in Denmark is to be presented with a pair of Danish clogs, and I'm very proud that <laughs> I now have a pair of Danish clogs. But, <laughs> but to get back to our, our own referendum, um, it, uh, I, 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 uh, it was a monumental, uh, there were mon monumental untruths spoken by the Remain side before the vote. Uh, they said that there was going to be economic collapse, pensions market would collapse, the housing market was collapsed, and so on and so on. It was all complete nonsense, and I thought it was. But they also accused us of lying when we weren't lying. Um, there was this myth put about that somehow we were lying. The £350 million pounds for possible, that could have been spent on the health service. Well, just the £10 billion we get back from not paying into the budget, that would give us £200 million, pounds, £200 million pounds a week. Um, then we adjust some of the subsidies and we get a bit more. But also, if the economy grows as it will, we get more tax revenues in and we, we will certainly get at least enough to afford the £350 million pounds a week for the health service, should we choose to spend it on the health service. And it's only that, we, as a qualification, it wouldn't automatically happen. The government would have to spend it. So it's not a lie. Uh, and I tried to make that point during the, the campaign, but it's very uncomfortable for them when they when they're brought up against the fact that they're accusing us of lying when actually they say or told all the lies. Um, so um, the the, uh, the calculations I think were also made by by the li official Leave campaign, uh, and I was at a select committee meeting last week um, where they explained that these figures were actually uh, taken from official statistics. They're not lies at all. Um, the other lie, of course, is that we're all racists. You know, that anybody who voted Leave was a racist. Well, I think that is complete nonsense as well. Uh, absolute poppycock, as I put it. Um, the, in, uh, in, in Luton, I have a constituency where half of all young people are non-white um, people from, originally from what was the Commonwealth. Um, and, uh, you know, they're about a third of the population are non-white, but we voted big time for, to Leave. And a high proportion of those people... Uh, uh, voted to leave as well. So I hardly think they're going to be racists if, if they're black people in a majority white country voting for, to, to leave the EU. But free, U, free movement is about white European people coming from countries where they're not threatened by violent death, where they're not starving. Now, they're less well off than we are, and I want solidarity and brotherhood and sisterhood with my European colleagues. But it's, it's a very different if we allow complete free movement for white people from Europe coming in, but have very strict controls on refugees with brown skins from Syria, for example. Um, I think that's the wrong way round. If we didn't have free movement, we might be able to accept a few more refugees from Syria. I think that would be a much more moral position than free movement. So I, I say, let, let's stop free movement. Let's have the same immigration rules for everybody, whether they come from the Commonwealth or the European Union or wherever, uh, and let's make sure that immigration rules, whatever they are, however strict they are, are fair and equal for all. So um, free movement has also been a disaster for some Eastern European countries. Uh, the, the former foreign minister of Estonia, a woman who negotiated Estonia's entry to the EU, she now regrets that because hundreds of thousands of their brightest and best young people have now gone to live and work abroad. They're being denuded of their best people. And just recently, Lithuania has had the same situation. They've now got a party, not an anti-immigrant party, an anti-emigration party, because they want, to hold, they want to keep hold of their best and brightest young people to make sure their country has a, a, a future. Um, a, another nonsense about Lithuania, and I was in Lithuania a couple of years ago, is that they have... Um, they used to be self-sufficient in food. It's quite a large area with a small population and they could, they could feed themselves. They're now being paid not to grow food and there are thousands of acres of Lithuania just not growing food. And so they have to import food. It's all part of the common agricultural policy. So paying them not to grow food when they were self-sufficient, I think, is complete total nonsense. So um, free movement, I think, has to go. Um, and uh, where we need to recruit specific skills, we can do so. We can have seasonal workers who can come over and work doing what, what seasonal workers do, um, and, and so on. But there's also another factor in all of this. We, we talk about the trade balance and other factors, but people who work in Britain, many of them, actually use remissions sent back to their families in, in Eastern Europe, mainly. And so there's an outflow of cash from Britain, which is sort of hidden, you know, a large, large amount of money, I mean, millions, if not billions, every year, probably billions, in fact. Um, but there's also a net outflow of income for British 
the majority of British people overseas actually live on incomes derived from Britain. So again, there's an outflow of money <laughs> from, from Britain. So there's another part of our economy which is seeing a, a drain to the EU, um, which we could do without. I'm not suggesting we should bring back all the expatriates, and in fact, I don't think the French or the Spanish would like that very much, because that money goes straight into their economy, and in many parts of their countries, the housing market depends upon British expatriates living there to keep the housing market alive, keeping villages and towns in, in nice parts of the continent alive. And I'm you know, very, very, very keen on that, as I indeed I'm very keen on the recent um, surge of, of people coming from the <coughs> EU to shop in Britain because the depreciation of the pound has meant everything's much cheaper. And they're pouring in, pouring money into our shops in London in particular, uh, which is, a, you know, again, very, very beneficial. Um, so we, we have, I think, uh, just recently seen, since the referendum, of course, all the lies were, were complete nonsense. We've seen the economy bounce. We've seen manufacturing um, now looking much healthier for the future. We've even got forecasts that suggest that next year there's going to be growth and the year after is going to be growth. They say there's a bit of, bit of inflation. They're trying to put negative spin. Everything beneficial, they always try and put negative spins on. Even the investment in Nissan in Sunderland. They try to book a neg negative spin. Oh, well, you know, it might have been because somebody's made a promise about state aid. I actually believe in state aid. Why shouldn't we? You know, that makes sure our manufacturing uh, prospers if we need to give them a bit of regional grant or whatever. But I don't think there's anything wrong with state aid. But, of course, the EU does. The EU prevents us using state aid. The EU prevents us from using public procurement. So we can't go around and say, well, we're going to buy um, Nissan motor car, Nissan car scrap police force. You know, we can't do that because the EU won't let us do that. And if we want to rebuild manufacturing, as I think we should, I think we've got to be able to use those instruments um, in future. But the key to it all was actually having a depreciation. Had we voted to stay in the EU, there would have been an enormous um, surge in the value of the pound, which would, could have killed off what remains of British manufacturing, made our exports even more expensive and our imports even cheaper. So the fact that we've come out, there's been a bit of a depreciation. Uh, the one bit of tragedy, of course, is that my, 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 my French wine has gone up in price, which is, I have to say, it's driving me to the edge of bankruptcy. But, <laughs> but so, you know, little things like that actually are nowhere near as important as making sure we have an industry that works for the future. Um, and and uh, I think you know, a bringing the pound to a more sensible value was actually, actually a, a brilliant uh, um, development. And, of course, it's not just me saying that. Um, Lord Mervyn King, former Governor of the Bank of England, he's cheered it to the rafters, saying what a brilliant idea. The former Deputy Director of the IMF has said it's brilliant. You know, Britain's bouncing back amazingly well from the referendum. They're all very positive about what's happened to the economy since the referendum, making complete uh, nonsense of everything that was said beforehand uh, uh, the, from, by, by, the, by the, the woes who are trying to persuade us to stay in. Um, so, as I say, the economy is growing. Uh, we've got forecasts of good growth for two years. Um, the depreciation, I hope, continues going on. But we also have had other world um, figures telling us what a good thing it is. We've had Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning American economist. Um, he says Britain can prosper outside the EU. And he said that the biggest nonsense of all in the European Union is the euro. Having rigidly, rigidly fixed currency values between countries which are very different economies is nonsense. You know, it is the, just Greece and Italy ought to be able to depreciate their currency so that they can manage their economies. That's been taken away from them and it's causing terrible, terrible damage. Um, I, I've said during my, 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 my many, many speeches that uh, what happened in, in, in Greece was, was a crime. Um, the fact that we've got 25% unemployment. 25% unemployment in Britain would mean 7.5 million on the dole. That's how bad it is. And we've seen the economy contract by 25%. So living standards have gone down by 20%. Um, it's, it's been absolutely terrible. And young people, of course, 50% unemployment. And that sort of thing is happening to a lesser extent, but almost as bad in, in other parts of Southern Europe as well. All because they can't manage their economies because they're fixed, fixed in the euro. Uh, and that's making them, making them, uh, it, it, uh, they can't, can't cope. Larry Elliott, writing in The Guardian some time ago, said, had we joined the euro, and of course there was a possibility we might join it, fortunately, the, the collapse of the exchange rate mechanism in, uh, in 1992, which damaged the Conservative Party very badly, because they, John Major said it was going to be a great success, and it turned out to be a disaster. 
Um, that actually frightened the Treasury so much that in the end they decided not to join the Euro very, very wisely. Had we joined the Euro, uh, Larry Elliott said by now we would have had, it would have, we would have been tied in at sort of certainly over one, one Euro 40 to the pound. Could have been even higher than that, I think it was 148, I forget the precise figure. But it would have been a, a, a crippling overvaluation of the pound, which would have seen our economy like a big version of Greece. We would have crashed out of the euro and brought the whole thing down had we been inside the euro. I, I suppose in one sense that would have been a good thing because it would have killed off the euro, but it would have killed off the British economy as well, and that would not have been a good thing. But we had this intelligence to stay at the one part of economic policy where I did applaud Gordon Brown, but we teetered on the brink for a bit, didn't we? I mean, the joining of the euro would have been an absolute disaster. So... Um, <laughs> And the reality is, at some point, one country or another is going to leave the euro, and then once the, the others will leave the, leave the, the sinking ship. And when they start to leave that ship, you will see um, the, the, the euro dissolve, national currencies being re-established, countries managing their own economies, and some countries will have see their economy, I think, suffering a bit Germany. I don't want to frighten the Germans, but if the euro does collapse, um, all the other countries around... I mean, I call the private. I call the, the euro the Deutschmark. This is really the Deutschmark. We've got some weak currencies bolted onto it. Those weak currencies hold it down, which is a benefit to the Germans, but not a benefit to those countries tied into the euro. But it's also disadvantageous for us because we've got this big balance of trade deficit with, with Germany because the euro has been at a falsely low level. Um, if it was the Deutschmark just for Germany, it would be a, a different situation. We'd much more fair, competitive arrangement. So I, I do think that euro is going to collapse. And what's going to happen to the Deutsche Mark at that time is you can see what happened to the, the Swiss franc. The Swiss uh, pegged the franc to the euro for a long time. And a couple of years ago, they decided to break the link. And uh, over a weekend, the Swiss franc appreciated by 30%. Um, now, something similar is going to happen to the Deutsche Mark. I don't want to frighten the Germans, but that is likely to happen when the euro goes. But we have to get... I think, individual currencies for member states, again, so they can manage their own economies and, and as part of governing themselves again and start to recover from what the terrible ravages that the euro has brought, brought upon them. So, um, one other thing I would say is that, uh, as I said, some were trying to put a negative spin on, on, the, on the Nissan investment. Well, I think that's just the first sign of a, country, of a company saying, Britain's actually going to do much better in future. It's a place to invest now, so we're going to invest in Britain. I like to think that other motor manufacturers will be sensible as well, bringing some of their supply chain in. So it's not just a, you know, not, not just assemblers, but actually supply chain providers built, built in Britain. Start to make our manufacturing sector larger again, bring it up to a reasonable level comparable with other uh, in, industrial countries. Um, but uh, it's, I, I did just say that the people of Sunderland, despite all the propaganda about oh, Nissan will leave and all the car companies will disappear overseas, it, despite all that, the Sun people of Sunderland voted overwhelmingly for to leave the European Union, and they've been rewarded by a big Nissan investment in their town, which is fantastic. So I, I, I really do, do think we are we are set set fair for the future. The, the possibility of uh, trade war between ourselves and the rest of the EU? I, just, I don't think that's likely at all. We are such a big market and we have such a massive trade deficit with them. In other words, we buy much more from the EU than we sell to, to the rest of the EU, particularly to Germany. The last thing they're going to do is have, want to trade war with us because that would damage them more than it would damage us. So, and, and, but lots of good work has been done on this by, by uh, organisations like Civitas and there's lots of very, very good work um, done, done by Civitas on these things. I think we are, I'm very optimistic about the future. I think Britain is going to prosper outside the EU. And I, what I want to see, I want to see other countries voting for democracy, voting for self-government as well. Thank you.